Hi everyone, Hi. this is Avinash and Nick and welcome to the Point and Click Web Analytics TV show. <laughs> We're going to go with um, our first question. And the first question is for you today. Oh uh, good. It's from Pearl D from Stads Canal, Netherlands. <laughs> We're getting international. Um, so the question is to you is how would you monetize or set goals for a website, for instance the butcher around the corner? I mean, for small sites, there are mostly five to six info pages in a contact form. The only goal, what I, goal, what I can think of is form filled in. So for these smaller businesses, how would you set up conversions uh, and think about the metric strategy for them? I mean, it, 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 it really does tie down to what the goals of your website are. I mean, if, if there are no calls to action on your website at all, um, then really there's not much that you can do in terms of tracking. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got a form, form filled out, yes, definitely do that. Um, if you've got an email contact, like contact us, send us an email, do that. If you've got a map, if you've got any um, things that are connected to a call to action, tie that um, back to your Google Analytics conversions or any, in any web analytics tool. Uh, but the other thing to think about is that um, using um, like unique 800 number, oh, I'm sorry, a unique phone number, just have a unique phone number on the website and, and track the phone calls that come in through that phone number. That's sort of not a very difficult thing to do now. Um, so at the end of the day, you can only create goals for any call to action you have. If your if your website literally for, for a butcher simply simply shows the butcher and the pieces of meat and and all that and is absolutely zero calls to action, then I guess you. If I'm a butcher, I would randomly ask people who come to my website, uh, to my store, hey, have you seen my website? And maybe use that as a conversion measure of success. But at the end of the day, it has to come back to a goal a lead that you got, a phone call you got, a product page that somebody viewed, uh, the number of pages might, somebody might have viewed, because now you can set goals mm -hmm. for the number of pages that people might have seen. So, okay, I'm a butcher, people saw four pages of all the cuts of meat. Maybe that's a success. So, um, tie it back to the, goal, um, to the goals of the website and either the behavior on the site using custom goals or um, on, on um, using offline ideas like uh, phone numbers or just surveying people who come into the store. Right. I think another uh, point to make is that it really depends on also site structure. So if you only have one page and you have your phone number there and your map of where to find you all on one page, you're not going to be able to set a goal and differentiate that between how people are finding you. So one idea is to have a, a contact us page where when Very people good. go to that page, you can set that up in, uniquely as a goal. Exactly. Yep. Great. So the next one, uh, also on goals, Nick, is for you. And mm -hmm. this one says, why are goals calculated based on unique views of a page requested? Shouldn't one person be able to complete a goal more than once? Some things uh, such as sending an e-card or recommend this article. And this is from um, Tim in Edmonton, um, Alberta. Hello, Canada. Hey. All right. So uh, I, I think really when we came out with goals, the whole point of goals was to tie that back into the referral and whether say whether this referral that drove a per, uh, person to the site for a visit actually converted or not. It was a very binary decision. You know, did they convert or not? Yes. Um, with a lot more Ajax pages and a lot more uh, sophisticated type of websites, you might want to have different events or page views that you would want to count the total number of those within a session. Um, so there's the way to do that in Google Analytics is to say uh, advanced segment. So for a particular source of traffic, let's say a search from Google, you would create an advanced segment uh, and you would apply that to your top content report. And then for the number of page views that represent a goal, you would then be able to say for people who came from Google, this is the total number of page views on a particular page. You can apply it to events, time on site, and so forth. So it's definitely possible to do today. Exactly. So I, I think that rather than using the goal reports, if you really want to count multiple page views, mm -hmm. A, consider using custom variables or event tracking right. as, as those things. And then going to those reports. Yep. Going to the content reports, going to the custom variable reports, and you'll be fine. Yep. You'll have the data you need. Definitely. Great. So here's the next question for you, Avinash. Um, so how is hang it? On, hang on, hang on. Oh. This one's for you, buddy. Oh, this is a good one for you. Uh -huh. I love this one. <laughs> it's from Aaron in New York City, and Aaron asks an excellent question. How is it possible to have an e-commerce conversion rate of more than one hundred percent? Right. So conversion rates are greater than a, a rate higher than hundred, right? Um, so it. it I'm not touching this one. It's, yeah, right. <laughs> so actually, if, if you understand how everything's calculated, which I'll explain, it actually becomes very apparent why it's possible. Um, so this report is called conversion rate, but it's found under the e-commerce section. Uh, and the calculation for this is actually the number of transactions divided by the number of visits. Mm -hmm. So because you can transact multiple times in your visit, right, you can have two transactions in one visit. Uh, for that visitor, the conversion rate, as it's calculated, is 2 over 1. 
right. which is greater than 100%. And that's why you see it. Um, this calculation for conversion rate under e-commerce is different than our standard conversion rate, which when you actually convert on a goal, it's only once per session. Uh, and so that case, you know, you couldn't have uh, a greater number of conversions than number of visits. So basically, I can actually choose to take the same thank you.dhtml or whatever order confirmation page, mm -hmm. um, and Google Analytics will automatically create an e-commerce conversion rate for that page. But, but you're advising me also to set up a goal conversion set that up as a goal as well, and then the goal conversion rate will be deduped, and it will only be for one right. action taken in each session. And the difference between those two can help us understand if people are indeed placing more trans transactions more transactions in a single session. Absolutely. Um, and that would be very clear. So yep. to set it up both as a goal and as an e-commerce conversion. Yep, great. Uh, okay, so uh, now it's time for a question for you, <laughs> Uh So we made a tracker for banner conversion using mm -hmm. the URL builder. The banner showed only one day on a website, though it's been more than 20 days now that we're receiving visit counts. Is there a way to track it during that session when click? And that's, again, from Pearl D from um, the Netherlands. Okay, oh, good, good question. So th there are two important things to realize. The first is the data capture side of things. So today, if I click on a, a banner um, or a organic search link or a paid search link or any kind of, literally, Google calls all these things campaigns, whether they are paid or unpaid. So organic is not pay, uh, paid. So. When I come to the website today and it sets a campaign cookie on for me, my subsequent visits, unless I use a, a different channel to come to the website, will be attributed back to that particular campaign. In this case, it was a banner ad. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why 20 days after the, the, the banner campaign perhaps was closed, you're still seeing that it is delivering visits because it did bring me to your website the very first time and it, I, I continue to come back. Uh, if you do not want to have this behavior and you only want the, the credit for the first visit to go to the banner and no more visits to go to that, then it's actually very easy to do by uh, tweaking Google Analytics just a little bit. Uh, you use the set campaign cookie timeout function, set the value to zero, and what will happen is when I come to the website, it will credit that to the, uh, to the banner ad in your case, and then when I come back again from organic search, I actually just I just come back to your website from a bookmark. Mm -hmm. No matter how I come back, right. it will actually credit it as direct or mm -hmm. whatever else the thing is. So right. just set up, use that feature, um, set campaign cookie timeout function, and it'll, it'll just time out your cookie, yep. and, and no more visits will be attributed to that. And we'll we'll put a link on the on the video and the post uh, so that way you can find out how to get to that. Exactly. Be be very careful though. I mean, it, for things like this, one of my concerns is that. You, you, for, for perhaps one niche um, solu uh, uh, problem, you're going to apply a, 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 a particular solution that will apply across the board to all your campaigns and everything. Be very careful when you mess with cookies and mm -hmm. be very careful when you set with this. Ha have a much broader thought applied before you do these things. Absolutely. It's possible to do, though. Yep. Um, a question for you, Nick, from India. Mm -hmm. And it says, I have an AdWords account and I want to distinguish which visit is made by clicking on an AdWords ad versus made um, using organic search query in Google. Yeah, so we've made it really simple with Google Analytics. We've integrated with Google AdWords, and what you do is you, uh, in the Google Analytics interface, you put your Google AdWords account, and then within AdWords, you select a feature called auto-tagging. And what that does is for all the links that point back to your site from your ads, it appends a little query parameter, and when somebody clicks an ad, that parameter is there, uh, Google Analytics will capture that, and it'll map back the actual ad back to the full session and the referral and conversion and so forth. Um, so once you have that enabled, all the search reports will allow you to differentiate between paid and organic search. Also, you'll get a different AdWords section that specifically breaks out even more information about your AdWords campaign. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to see the difference between paid and organic, uh, enable this auto-tagging and link your AdWords and analytics accounts. And for all other search engines, for Yahoo and Baidu and Microsoft and, and all of the search engines, if you just um, use the, you can do manual uh, campaign tagging and, and make sure that your campaigns on other search engines are tagged with these tracking parameters for paid search ads, um, then it, Google Analytics will automatically split out um, the visits from other search engines that are coming from organic search and coming from paid search. For Google AdWords, it's easier. For other ones, you have to do a smidge of extra work, but you can absolutely do this. Yeah, we'll send a link also on how to set that up. Both of those. It's things. really easy. Good. Great. Uh, so, question for you, Avinash. Uh, can you recommend a reasonable target percentage of search terms that are branded search, head of search long tail, for a small college? 
Right now we have basically no long tail. 85% of our search terms are branded or related to a single random resource. Thanks. Um, so this is a good question. I'm afraid that there isn't a global rule that you can apply for a balance between paid and organic, oh, sorry, branded and non-branded, brand and category terms as they're known. Uh, that there isn't a global rule that you can apply. But typically, uh, your brand terms will form, bring people who are your loyalists who already know you or have heard about you. The power of the long tail is that it helps you bring all the impression virgins, um, quote unquote. I mean, people who don't know you, who've never heard of you. And, and I'm just searching for awesome college in Vermont. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I don't know where to go, but if you do show up in organic or paid search results, you can kind of bring me over to your website and convince me, like, you're the university that is right for me. Um, so it's important to have a healthy long tail and um, uh, a, a brand strategy for your website. If you, if you don't, if 85% is branded, I would say there is, there is an issue there. Uh, we will add a link um, to a blog post I've written about the, how to monetize the value of the long tail, and it'll be at the end of this blog post. Uh, please check out that link about how you could go about attacking the long tail. Great, great answer. Oh, so this one's about site engagement. Mm -hmm. My favorite topic in the world. Right. <laughs> So, um, the question is, uh, hi Avinash, I've seen many times in Google Analytics traffic sources report that whenever pages per visit is one from any referring sites or keyword, then average time on site recorded is zero and bounce rate is 100%. Please yep. help me out. So, this is a good question. It's important to realize that using any web analytics tool, um, you can't actually measure the time spent on the, on the last page of the visit. Right. The last page viewed on the visit because the way time on page itself is computed is let's say you see two pages, page A and page B. Um, there is a timestamp associated with page A, then there is a timestamp associated with page B. The web analytics tool subtracts these two timestamps and computes how long you spent on page A. That's really how it works. Mm -hmm. So for the last page in your visit, that there isn't a subsequent hit, if you will, to do do that calculation. And that's why what you're seeing is um, for single page view visits, there's no time available. We'll, we'll link to an article I've written on Time on Site for my blog. Um, and you can check that out about more nuances. But, but the reason you're not seeing is because for bounced visits, the last page happens to be the first page and there's no way to compute time on site without doing some major hacking, which is uh, links to which are in the blog post. So don't worry about that. Yep, great, we'll link it up. Oh, here's a good one from our good friend, Michael. Um, and uh, it's, it's a complicated one because Michael's a very complicated person. <laughs> oh. And he's asking, I was looking, in fact, to put, oh, sorry. Um, do you know why in custom reports, when you use a page dimension, you get unique visitor numbers that can be much higher than visits? Um, and then um, Michael says, perhaps he's uh, comparing apples and oranges. Um, this is, is indeed complicated. It seems counterintuitive that um, unique visitor numbers might be higher than visits. So what's going on here, Nick? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so let, let's talk, take a step back and think a little bit about how Google Analytics works. Uh, you put some tracking code on your site and you track different page views. Uh, that page view actually sends a one-by-one -one, uh, image request that's hidden that has a bunch of parameters that have data to Google Analytics. And so on our side uh, at Google, we see a huge list of all these one-by-one uh, -one image requests and we process all that data and so what we're able to deduce is the number of visits and then all the different page views within the visit that's the data model that we create sure. so for each of these dimensions and metrics that you request either from the UI and the web interface or through the API um, there's actually a function associated with the value um, that we actually apply all the visits for a unique profile mm -hmm. through these functions and we calculate the total number of visits and unique page views uh, and all the other dimensions and metrics as well so the calculations for visits and unique page views actually is different. For visit, what we look at is if uh, there is a hit or a page, um, any request within the visit, we increment the number of visits. For unique page views, what we say is uh, if there is two pages, we'll undo, undo them or we'll dedupe them, right? <laughs> so let me give you a concrete example and it'll make sense. So let's say you have two pages that you're tracking. One is foo and this other one is bar. Uh, and they come in that order, first foo, then bar. For number of visits, foo would get one visit, but bar would be zero because foo is the first one and bar is the second one. For unique page views, foo would get one and bar would get one. 
and it's because there's only one of each within the visit. So it is comparing apples and oranges. The calculations are different, um, and, and that's how it works. Okay, that's great. And then Michael, if you have if you have uh, if you have uh, more questions or further clarification on this, you've got my email address. So just just email me, and, and Nick and I can see mm -hmm. if he can provide you with more context. Great. A uh, question for you, Avinash. Hi, Avinash. I just saw the fourth episode of Web Analytics TV, and I have a question about user engagement. If I surveyed my visitors or put was this helpful polls on each web page or article would this help in determining engagement um, it would, so there it, it would so the short answer is that it would in fact it might even be better than using uh, tools like Google Analytics or Omniture or web trends who all you know might claim to do engagement uh, but the reality is quantitative data only tells you um, that the depth of engagement what it doesn't tell you is the kind of engagement and, and I think what Jacqueline uh, from Florida um, is, is outlining is a great strategy to measure the kind of engagement you have because you might have seen 10 pages on the Microsoft website, let's say, and you would be very happy because you found everything you want. Well, I spent 10 pages on Microsoft's website looking for a solution. I'm utterly frustrated. In the Web Analytics tool, both look highly engaged. Right. But if, if we follow the example Jacqueline's saying, we have a qualitative measurement say, hey, what did you complete your task mm -hmm. or whatever? they can find that this engagement was actually super awesome and my engagement was actually quite terrible. Um, and qualitative data is a great way to do that. So it's an excellent suggestion, Jacqueline. Yep, sounds great. Here's a question for you, Nick. Um, it's, it's, people do this all the time and it's uh, also from Netherlands and it says, we're going to use event tracker for outgoing links, downloads and mail to links. The question is, mail to links always have an email address that uh, and is it possible if, if they end up using event tracking for outgoing links uh, to then capture the email address um, um, on the contact forms and other things that they have? And um, Right, so yeah, technically it's possible. Um, one thing to be careful about with email addresses is our terms of service, mm -hmm. which says you will not collect any personal identifiable information and store that within Google Analytics. Mm -hmm or you'll take the Google Analytics data and, and correlate that with personally identifiable information. So as long as whatever you're sending to us via a page view, a virtual page view, or an event, event. doesn't have PII, then it's okay. Um, one of the options that you can do for links is instead of actually sending us the uh, email address, you can just say email link one versus mm -hmm. email link two. And then that way you know exactly kind of where that address is, but there's no uh, PII in GA, so it would uh, conform to terms. Exactly, and then for down, uh, outbound links and downloads, of course, that's not an issue at all. No. There's no, no PII there. Okay, good. Great, question for you from the Netherlands. Uh, hi guys, what are the rules of using virtual page views or event tracking on websites which are using Ajax heavily? This because our website generates a high number of unique page views. We use virtual page views all the time. So, so my, my advice to Art is that uh, we used to use virtual page views in the past mm -hmm. um, because Google Analytics didn't have some features, mm -hmm. and this is like a few years back. Yeah. But now that Google Analytics has event tracking available mm -hmm. and it has uh, custom variables available, you actually have significantly more sophisticated ways of capturing the data from dynamic websites, uh, Ajax, Video, Flash, Flex, yeah. whatever you're doing. Um, so I and strongly encourage you to move away from virtual page views unless you've got a very, very good reason to use it um, because all those virtual page views are polluting the rest of your data. Mm -hmm. I mean, your average time on site and average page views per visitor and all those metrics are getting messed up because right. you've got fake page views mixed in with real okay. page views. So just, just be careful of that. Other than that, in terms of the limits, um, uh, I, can, I can share with you some of the limitations that are available in terms of the, because you wanted the higher number. And uh, for page views, um, you know, it's 10, 10 million a month or more, if for, um, depending on if you're an AdWords advertiser or not. Uh, for event tracking, you can actually send 500 events a session, mm -hmm. which I think seems like a lot seems of events high, right. for a session, unless you're some weird person. And for custom variables, you can actually send, this is very cool, you can send five um, custom variables per hit. Right. Uh, now in a session, you could have any number of hits, essentially. Right. Um, man, many, many page views. The only limitation, if, if, if it is a limitation, is that you can only send five extra pieces of data with every hit. Right. And as many as you want. So, so both event tracking and custom variables uh, provide you really an enormously scalable, flexible, clean way of collecting lots of data while keeping the rest of your data free. So I, I strongly encourage you to try that. Yep. So we've got a question from Los Angeles, Nick, for you. And um, 
Is it possible to see content overview, traffic source, browser capability, etc. by location? Mm. Um, I think this is possible. It's definitely possible. So there's no actually location dimension, but there are cities, uh, states, countries, subcontinents, and so forth. So what you can do is create a custom report, and you can say, uh, for these cities, show me all these other uh, metrics. And so the custom report that would generate, say, Los Angeles, and in the values, it would say Cal um, San Francisco, all the values, and so forth. So that's one way. The other option is you can create an advanced segment. And the advanced mm -hmm. segment can say, for this city that equals uh, Los Angeles, show me all the metrics. And you can apply that to any of the reports and then get all the uh, appropriate data. And, 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 and a secret for the people who watch uh, Web Analytics TV, um, actually our good friend Caleb has created a Dimensionator plugin for Chrome and Firefox. If you use that, uh, it actually exposes the DMA in Google Analytics, which, oh, which wow. is not a dimension that is available in the drop-down or advanced segments. Uh, but we'll add a link to Caleb's excellent um, yeah. hack. And uh, you actually can then uh, go down to DMA, uh, which really is very useful for lots of people who do online and offline advertising because a lot of targeting yeah. is actually done by DMA, including radio, television, and everything. So, mm -hmm. so we'll add that link, and this is a top secret. Don't tell anybody, and it's just for people who watch WebMedics TV. <laughs> we'll link it up. <laughs> uh, another one for you, Nick, real quick. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and this one's from Mark, and Mark says, I think we all might need some guidance on custom variables, me too, <laughs> like way to find them in reports. Um, I have set them up okay in the code, but I don't see anything in the reports. Where should I be looking for? So, so where can we find the custom variable reports in Google Analytics, Nick? Right, so if on the left-hand nav, you click under visitors, and then on one of the sub-menus will say custom variables. And you click on that and you'll get the reports. And so custom variables gives you some really basic information, like how many, uh, so in custom variables, there's a couple parameters you set to us. You give us the name, the value, and then what we call the scope, whether it's a hit or a page, a session, or a visitor. And so what we'll say is, what are the total number of times we've seen custom variables, right? Um, that's what the report shows you. And in and of itself, it's not maybe that glamorous, but when you think about it, custom variables allow you to describe either a visitor, a session, or a page. Right. And with those descriptions, you can apply them to advanced segments. And then you can say, for people who've logged in in this session, show me the total revenue versus people who haven't. So they become very powerful when you start applying them to advanced segments. And, and that's available through the advanced segment builder. Exactly. And, and I, I really think that the true power of custom variables is you usually collect metadata. So if, if you really want to uh, be a ninja, you know, mm -hmm. then, then you want to use advanced segmentation. I, I think it's just absolutely key for mm -hmm. you to find the insights you need. Um, so we've got a bunch of feature requests here from you, and, I, and we, we love hearing feature requests. Uh, um, so let me just tell you which ones we've got most recently. Um, and the first one we've got from the Netherlands, uh, it says, um, are we going to have more gold types than destination URLs, time and site, and pages per visit? Um, that, that's a good request. Another one is, would it be possible to delete e-commerce transactions within analytics? And all tools, uh, Omniture, Web Trends, Google Analytics, Yahoo Analytics, all tools kind of have this limitation. Uh, so that's a good request. Um, another one is about the access, the security access. Um, um, we've got this from Oxford in the UK, and they want to have more access beyond view only and admin. So that, that's, a, that's an interesting good request, I think, for large companies. Yeah. Uh, will Google Analytics track Silverlight usage without having to add custom events? So you can do this already, but they want to they do this in, in, Simpler, uh, in yeah. a more automated way, like Probably Flash. Probably similar to Flash, yeah. And uh, while it's possible to create 20 goals in a profile, would it be possible to include the more than the first four in custom reports? Uh, so these are all excellent requests. We're going to take this, direct, literally, we're going to walk out of this room and give That's it to yeah. the, the, the people who run the GA team. And, and impress upon them how much you want these things, so we'll pass them on directly to the top. Uh, some of these are actually pretty pretty important, I think, especially the last one, yeah. I think is absolutely key. I think it's, 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 it's criminal that I'm not able to add right. more than four goals into my custom reports, because I love custom reports. Um, so we'll, we'll try and get your voice to the team and uh, get this thing going. Just as a plug for the API, though, we do oh, have all 20 in the exactly. API. Exactly. No, no, no. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And um, maybe we'll add some links to some tutorials to the API to this blog post, just in case people are new. And they want they to don't play around with it, yeah. But, but, but this is one, actually, this is a great point, I think, that you've made, is, is some of these things um, you can actually overcome with just a smidgen of technical 
technical knowledge by using the Google Analytics API because it's open, it's flexible, it's got all the data. Sometimes from the front end, if you're not able to do something, I strongly encourage you uh, to read some of the tutorials that Nick has created himself and, and see how utterly easy it is for you to literally overcome the limitations of the front end mm -hmm. and just still do anything you want to do. Um, things that sometimes you're not able to do even in other tools. So that actually, yeah. it's, it's not just a plug, it's, it's a great <laughs> solution to some of these feature requests. So. Um, so with that, we'll close. Uh, please keep your questions about anything Google Analytics or Web Analytics coming. We love answering them. Please go to the moderator page to submit the questions. And also please vote on the questions that you like best that other people have submitted. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Take care.